right, so all I really wanted to do was to come on uh, and just let folks know who may not be familiar with just the process of how how IHL chooses presidents, and 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 this is not, and I'm, I want to be clear. This is just so people can know what the process is. This is not me saying we're going to need a new president. We're not going to need a new president. But I think a lot of times people need to know what, what that process is so they can be active in that process. So theoretically, once uh, IHL uh, gets with the uh, a particular collective or committee at a university, they announce, uh, they, they have a search. They announce a search. And what tends to happen in the proper way is that often there are three or four entities that have to be on the same page for uh, a person to become a finalist. There's the faculty, that's one entity. The staff, that's another entity. The students, that's a third entity. The alumni, that's a fourth entity. And then you may also have a community. Community. So what happens is those, and, and what happens is all five of those groups have a representative group. And so they go through the applicants. And then what happens is that those five groups will then recommend to IHL, and then IHL will then choose. And often those groups will have a, a tier ranking. So they'll say, we want this person first, this person second, this person third. They send it to the board, and then the board then chooses. Now, in an ideal world, when I say in an ideal world, for the white schools, they tend to take, so if Ole Miss, Mississippi State, USM, uh, Delta State, blah, 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 tend to say, this is who we want. IHL tends to take that recommendation and says, this is who they want. But there's also something that they can do, that they tend to do, that allows them to have a little bit more leverage. When I say they, that their alumni will do. So that when you see a president's salary, all of that salary is not paid by the state. Some of that salary or a portion of that salary is paid by the alumni and the other entities. So the more that the more that the alumni pays, the more power and sway they have on their president. So HBCUs have three things working against us. The first thing working against us is, and we've actually been pushing for this about 25 years, they just won't do it. The board, the actual board, is comprised of people that the governor picks. And because the board is comprised of people that the governor chooses, then generally HBCUs will only have one or two representatives, and then all the other representatives will be from the white institutions. So you're already outnumbered, right? It's already going to be a... Uh, six to two or eight to two. I always forget what that number is because we've never had, I don't think, more than I think three HBCU representatives on that board ever. So, so that's the first thing that works against us. The second thing that works against us is because as alumni, we don't raise enough money to supplement the president's salary. So again, and th these are th these are hypothetical, and I hate to give hypothetical numbers because we know what happened the last time somebody gave, gave some hypothetical numbers. It was used against us to say we weren't paying our coast properly, right? So let me say it again: these are hypothetical numbers. So let's say if old Mrs. President makes about three hundred thousand, I don't know what the number is, but you can you can actually go because all these numbers are public. So let's say that old Mrs. President makes about three hundred thousand. Their alumni probably will have uh, you know about 25 percent maybe somewhere some schools their alumni will pay 25 to 50 percent of that president's salary so with that much if the if if the college board tries to give them a president they don't want they'll just take their money well the problem with hbcus if we don't they try to give us a president we don't want well all we can do is take out eight dollars and 22 cents which ain't gonna really impact the amount of the salary 
So often what happens is our faculty, our alumni, our students, our staff, and our community will choose two or three finalists that IHL will ignore and choose somebody else. And because we don't have, and, and that has happened constantly. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds with our current president because, as, as Ken has rightfully said, there's an ongoing investigation. And anything I say about that process, you know how people can't hold two thoughts in their head. So if I say something about that process, people will want to connect it to that investigation. But I just want to so if if you, to, I'm saying this to both alumni and also people who live in the community of Jackson State. You don't actually have to be an alumni to be a part of the presidential uh, uh, choosing the president. So those of you who are alumni need to start really getting active with, with the national alumni so you can at least know who from the alumni is going to be on that committee if we have to do a, another presidential search. Because that's what needs to happen so that we can all be on accord. But the, the other part is often we are on accord. Because I can tell you for certain that with at least three president searches, the people that the students, faculty, alumni, staff, and community chose were not the people that IHL chose. That's it. That's, I can tell you that for certain for three searches. And so, and again, because we don't have enough financial influence, that's what that's what allows them to be able to do that to us. And then just, just coming back to that last point, when people talk about your voting, right? This is another one of things where, where when you vote and don't vote matters. What we really want to push for is we want to go to the legislature and find a way to stop the governor from choosing who sits on IHL, what should truly happen is every college and university should have a representative. So that that's what would make it more fair. So that, so that at least every term, Jackson State, Alcorn, Valley, Cahoma Community College, well, I can't say Utica no more because Utica's high, but so now what happens is if you now have four black representatives, those four black representatives can vote in a block. Now, watch this. They may not have enough. Those four may not have enough to win on their own. But those four together unified can go to the others and say, hey, give us what we want. Or we going to vote another way. So let's say the, the old Miss and Mississippi people, state people are beefing. We can take our four together and go, which one of y'all going to give us the best deal for our schools? And then that's the way we'll vote for y'all. But we can never do that as long as we don't have proper representation. And so we have to take it from having the government. So that's it. That's all I wanted to say is just at least, at least enlighten people on that. The, the problem is knowing actually how presidents are chosen. And again, and that's the last thing I want to say. Remember that community committee. So don't think that you, if you live in the Jackson State community, or you live in the Alcorn community, you live in the Valley community, you say, well, I love these schools even though I didn't graduate. There is a place for you in the presidential search. Why? Because that university sits in your community. And one of the things that we talk about, we talk about being good corporate neighbors, right? People who are in business know about being, about being corporate neighbors. And so as the community, you have a right to demand that the university in your community is a good corporate neighbor, which is why you have a right to be on the search committee to ensure that you're choosing a president who's going to be a good corporate neighbor. All right, so that's it. I just wanted to cover those. Um, 